Herzlich willkommen, mein Name ist Claudia Hoppe, das ist Folge 33 meines Impro-Podcasts. Ich bin leider immer noch ein bisschen äh, erkältet, immer noch die gleiche Erkältung, die mich schon beim Interview mit Kathi Freudenschuss geplagt hat, aber ähm, so ist es nun mal. Und auch dieses Mal habe ich einen nicht deutschsprachigen Gast hier bei mir in meinem kleinen Zuhause-Studio. And uh, this is why I'm now going to switch to English. With me is Nils Peter Morland from the Norwegian group That Andre Theatret. Perfect pronunciation. <laughs> it's perfect. <laughs> And uh, because I'm German, for me it's very easy to recognize that this is uh, the other theater. Correct. Das andere Theater, Yes. you say in German. So, um, yeah, welcome Niels. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for having me. It's very nice. <laughs> uh, did I pronounce your uh, your surname correctly? Morland? Or is it well, it's the tricky, you know, O with a, with a slash mm -hmm. through it. So it's the Ö. Ah, it's Merland. Ah, perfect. Okay, I see. <laughs> There you go, Merland. Yes. Great. Niels, I saw your guys' romantic comedy format this year in uh, Göteborg, and I have to say that it really um, blew me off my feet, and you <laughs> had uh, standing wow. ovations back there in Göteborg, as far as I remember. Gothenburg, sorry. Yeah. Um, and yesterday you guys played the same format here in Berlin at yes. the Ratibor Theater, and I think it was pretty awesome Again, though uh, no standing ovations, unfortunately, but I think that's more to the German audience. They are a bit like, I think they don't know that you can actually stand up to applaud. <laughs> well, it's also, it's, uh, I mean, you know, the chairs in Ratibur is a bit small, so it's like uh, the lines are a bit tight. Maybe it's tricky to stand yeah, up. I don't know. Yeah, I think it's also a bit tricky. Like, when you stand up, you have like the person next to you. Like, it's like a chain reaction. Yeah, like yeah. No, we felt uh, we could feel the love from the audience, so we were, we were happy. Yeah, I think you had like 10 minutes of applause or something like that. <laughs> yeah, that was very nice. Yeah. It was, we felt very well taken care of. Yeah. And um, uh, yeah, I want to use this opportunity of having you here to talk about that format with you. But um, yeah, first the question to you, how happy have you been with the show yesterday? It was, uh, I think it was a good show. We had a lot of fun. It was uh, both uh, a bit of, um, you know, uh, stupidity and emotional scenes and some very physical Some weird stuff and some funny stuff and some smart stuff and some, yeah, a little bit of everything. I, th I thought it was a good show. It was an interesting uh, version for us to do because uh, uh, this is usually a one act. Ah, so, so you don't do a break in between? No, usually we don't. No, it's usually like a 50 or 60 minute show and then th that's it. But, you know, that's the way it is. Some venues you come to, they really want you to do an intermission for, you know, beer sales or for, I don't know, whatever reason. And um, we thought it was an interesting opportunity for us to explore a longer version of uh, this format. So... Um, How happy were you with, uh, with the... Um, well, yeah, we were discussing it after the show last night. Uh, there was a couple of things that we could explore that we don't get the opportunity when we do a 60-minute. Um, uh, this has to do with the idea of a romantic comedy because a romantic comedy usually have two turns it's like um like the beats of the dramaturgy of it is usually that you see two people and you go oh they will never fall in love and then you go oh they did fall in love mm -hmm. and then you go oh, what happened they're not in love anymore this is never gonna work out oh yes it worked out in the end even you know so that sort of second beat there is tricky to get into one hour and we struggle with that from time to time to get the Even even if this show, I mean, this format doesn't have like a very rigid, you know, dramaturgy or or shape to it. There's no there's no beats we have to touch, but just to get that feeling of a romantic comedy um, was interesting to do in two halves, and we were very inspired afterwards and saying that we should try to do it back home in two halves uh, because we could explore some of the side characters a little bit more, which uh, I find enriching the picture in total. And we could also spend more time with developing the relationship between the uh, the protagonist and the love interest. Or like, yeah, well, in the romantic comedy, the love interest is very often also thought about as the antagonist, even if it's not like in a traditional dramaturgical way. And yeah, yeah, let's talk about this later then. So yeah. uh, the, um, uh, I forgot my question that I wanted to ask the... Uh, the intermission, did it, uh, um, uh, did you, yeah, now I remember, uh, did you use it to uh, talk about what's going to happen next or are you like very strict about it so we're not talking about the show during the intermission? 
Uh, what did we talk about? I think uh, we usually, when we have shows like long form, sh- long form shows that have an intermission, I guess we usually spend time on just talking about what happened. So we would remind ourselves, oh, what was the idea about those two characters? Why did they? Oh, yes, that's his goal. Oh, that's his goal. Ah, oh, yeah, there's something there. Just to remind ourselves about all the material that we've created. Um, uh, I think that's usually what we talk. I don't. I think someone said uh, you should. Um, you should say that uh, you should stop saving whales and save me instead. Uh, <laughs> but that line never made it into the second half. But I think I yeah uh, we, we're not very strict about it. Uh, I think it's just a natural tendency not to think ahead. But but the, and it's more interesting to talk about what just happened in a way. So that's what we do in the in the break, and then we, you know, just talk with about stupid stuff. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, Niels, when did you arrive in Berlin? Mm. We arrived uh, yesterday. Just uh, we, uh, did we arrive like uh, two or three o'clock in the afternoon or something? So we just had time to get into the hotel and do our technical get in. Because okay. this show has a, you know, because it has a DJ there, so there's, there's a bit of a technical. Some venues you come to doesn't have the equipment, and so we have to rent some stuff and blah 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 blah. So, uh, what's your impression then of Berlin so far? Oh, very good. I mean, there's so many years since I've been to Berlin. Um, uh, oh, so many years, which is weird because I used to have a friend living here, so I was here a couple of times with him, but. Um, I I act I really love Berlin. There was like a there was like like ten years ago, everyone in Norway moved to Berlin. It was like everyone would move to Berlin. Now everyone moves to New York. So that says something about the economy in that little oil country up there. But uh, uh, I I love Berlin very much, and it's a very interesting uh, place when it comes to improvised theater because it's had from the outside looks like it's had an explosion. Like with improv, the last ten, maybe ten, fifteen years or something. I don't know how. Yeah, it feels like that also from the inside. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> we were talking about this before on the way here. That Berlin has like thirty to forty improv groups, if not more. But also that most of these groups are then actually, yeah, laymen. So they are not professional, not mm. doing it for a living or for business. Because, uh, and we were also talking about that before. That it's it's very hard to earn. Money with performing improv, mm. actually, but that's a different topic. Maybe we get back to that. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Let's see. Um, so, where are your peers then, right now? Um, they went home. <laughs> <laughs> so they really came only for the show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the idea was for people to have like a weekend in Berlin. I'm staying here for the weekend, but um, um, we have back home there's uh, I mean this is the first week of after New Year's so there's no shows on at our theater we have a couple of weeks of administration and just preparing the season but uh, two of the girls who are playing in the show has a development week so they're working with um, with uh, Kayla from the Suffrets from Toronto so she's actually in Norway now having a day off <laughs> because we were had to go to Berlin so they had to just get home as quick as possible so, um, um, but we are coming back, uh, at least some of us, in March for the festival as well. Ah, okay, cool. Mm. So, do you um, often perform outside of Norway or outside of Oslo? Well, um, I wouldn't say often. Uh, I'd say more and more. Um, the Our theater, or like the venue that we are in, um, that we, that we run, uh, is now soon to become five years. It's five years in September. So the first couple of years, we concentrated mostly on sort of building a repertoire, building an audience, um, and uh, yeah, building the ensemble and you know the organization per se. And so we didn't travel much or didn't sort of stay in touch with so many of our friends around. But we did have a lot of groups visiting us, but we didn't go much out. So, but the last year and a half, I think there's been more. We had more time. We have uh, earned some sort of a reputation. I don't know what our reputation is, but to some degree, it seems like uh, people want to invite us to different <laughs> stuff. So I guess it's pretty good. Uh, and uh, so I'd say the this year, there's I'd say there might be four or five festivals going on through the year, and then some other some other visits as well. 
this month we're doing this one in Ratibor. There's two of people from the ensemble going to Atlanta to visit wow. Dad's Garage wow. to play there. And then there's uh, we're going to uh, Amsterdam Festival with uh, when they met actually this show. And uh, yeah, that's I think what's happening in January. Mm -hmm. And um, you live in Oslo, yes. right? Yes. And are you from Oslo or are you from... Uh, you are Norwegian, right? Yes. And are you uh, uh, born a native Os Osloanian? Osloanian? <laughs> well, uh, um, I mean, most of my life I lived in Oslo. I was actually born in the south. Um, but, you know, Norway is really, really small. So Oslo is the only sort of major city it's mm. the only city with a certain kind of a size there's um when did you move to oslo at what age oh i well, how old was i like 18 19 or something oh. when i started studying basically that's 19 i was 19 when i moved there mm -hmm. what And did you what did you study what did you start well i i studied uh, uh, so much different weird things uh i studied theology i've uh, and then i also studied to be a drama pedagogue so this is where my theater interest started out but i also worked as a uh, i've been wasting my life on so much different weird things <laughs> i worked as a photo assistant i was a web designer <laughs> i worked how, as a, how old as are a you by now? i'm 40 uh, so uh, i've done a lot of yeah i uh, i used to do work in an ad agency i've been yeah but the last Uh, 15 years, about the last 15 years, I've only been doing theater. And before that, I did all different kind of things. And when did you start to improvise? I mean, improv. Well, that's theater. actually 15 years ago. That's 15 years ago. Uh, yeah. Pretty, pretty much on the spot 15 years ago. Uh -huh. and, and where or how, in what context? Yeah, I, I used to do, I had a little bit of touchdown in the stand up community. So I did. Uh, um, Someone thought I was a funny guy, and then usually the stand-up community is very quick on saying, "Yeah, you should try to do a you know stand-up routine here." And so I did that, and I and I worked on stand-up for a year and a half. I toured a bit, um, earned some money, and then uh, I mean I like stand-up uh, if it's good, but I it didn't it wasn't I had background from theater from before, so it didn't really feel like it fulfilled. Uh, what I wanted to do with comedy. Like I wanted to do different things with comedy. So I, and I wasn't, probably just because I wasn't good enough, I couldn't really make that happen with stand-up. I, I, I wasn't able to do interesting stuff for myself, basically. Um, and then uh, the, there was someone arranging an improv workshop with um, a no good friend of mine, Tony Totino, who's uh, an ex-loose mooser from, from Calgary, um, who moved uh, to Norway in the 80s and um, sort of brought Keith Johnstone's um, <laughs> work to, I would say, to Scandinavia almost. Um, and he uh, he had a workshop only for stand-up comedians, actually. And then... Improv workshop. Yeah, an improv workshop for, for stand-up comedians. And I... I'd never, I never, I guess I'd seen a little bit of some improv somewhere, I don't remember. And I went to the workshop, there was some other friends of mine going there, and we ended up doing some shows afterwards, because Tony said you should try to do some shows, and then we did. And then slowly during uh, the first five or six months, it, we sort of evolved into a little group, and then we started having shows, and then basically since then I've been performing almost at least every week since. Hmm. And what made you stick with improv? <sighs> That's a good question because I was a terrible improviser in the <laughs> beginning. I, I'd say I'd probably spent five years becoming a decent improviser and then another five years of being what I now think is a, is a good improviser. Um, uh, why did I stick with it? It's such a good question because... I should have stopped because I was really terrible. Uh, um, I don't know. I think in the beginning, I think I, I stick with it for the same reasons that a lot of other people do, that you are able to get a laugh, you get to stand on a stage, you get an instant feedback, you're having fun, you're with nice people, and it's a matter of just, uh, I don't know. Uh, I've always been working with theater. I always wanted to stand in front of other people and get the uh, acknowledgement via applause <laughs> and laughter. So I think there's uh, some, to some level, there's probably a psychological disposition in me that sort of made it this here. 
I can get what I need. <laughs> this is my drug. Uh, and I couldn't stop. And um, there's, there's, there's a great oral history book uh, from Canada about the early days of the loose moose called Something Like a Drug. And I, uh, I think that's, that's what it was. It was like I couldn't stop that first moment that I think a lot of improvisers get, that falling in love with the work. It's like a rush where you understand this is incredible. This happens and it's so good, which it wasn't, but you know that you think it's so good that that I think that's sort of, yeah. And now I can't stop in a way, I think. <laughs> so then um, uh, we kept on doing it with that group for several years and then um, that sort of faded out and I started with a couple of friends, another we started something at another theater with Maestro and I continued working in theater on like as my profession and uh, and working with theater and TV and stuff like that uh, but wanted to explore more and then we had a we put up a weekly maestro at the university at like what show uh, maestro maestro impro ah, Ma Ma maestro maestro mm. maestro and um, so we did that uh, we put that up to make uh, to try to build uh, the community in 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 Oslo a bit uh, bigger and also to 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 make a place where we felt that people could go to to learn how to improvise without having to pay money for it. So the maestro was like a uh, was the idea of making like a little hub in the Oslo community. At that point, uh, you have to stop me now because now I get into a place <laughs> where I'm really comfortable, which is talking about <laughs> improv history in Oslo. Um, but the, the thing is that in Oslo, it was a really big community for a small city as Oslo. There were some really skilled groups already then. This is like uh, 10 years ago or something. Uh, but there wasn't that much interaction. All the people knew each other, but there wasn't that much interaction. So the, the Maestro show was like a way of getting a common ground where people can come to visit and play and have fun. And then they could be away for a couple of months and they'd come back. And it was like, like, a, like a little cabin like a vacation place for everyone. And so it was also a place where we could recruit a lot of new workers, uh, like uh, new improvisers. And then uh, we started to fill up the house and we got uh, really good seasons at that uh, student theater. And then uh, at some point, I think uh, we all were just, uh, this is going really good. Shouldn't we be, you know, getting our own theater? And then someone said, yeah, that's probably a good idea. And we had no idea how to do it. So we... We started, uh, we just had this plan that we would tell everyone that we met that we were looking for a place to build a theater because we wanted to build our own. Uh, and we did that for a couple of years and then suddenly I was out walking and I met a guy and he was like, oh, I haven't seen you in a while. And I was like, yeah, yeah, what are you doing? Oh, I'm looking for a place to start a theater. And he was like, ah, you should talk to my father. He has just bought an old building. Maybe you could do something there. And we met up and Sim Salabim, in the end, we <laughs> built our own theater. Cool. <laughs> so it comes, our theater comes out of a, like years of a really strong community in Oslo with, with a lot of really strong performers. And so this all merged together in the Andre Theater. Mm -hmm. Nice. And uh, Niels, do you have a favorite improv trainer? Well, I think there's been two teachers that have changed my course uh, in different ways. One is Tony at the theater, Tony Totino, um, which I think uh, is responsible for me, you know, wasting my life on doing uh, things that uh, will never happen again. Uh, and he sort of opened my eyes for all of this wonderful. And he also taught me a lot about the, about the attitude towards the work. I think my attitude towards the work uh, I do as an improviser, I sort of almost copied, tried to copy what Tony always, how he behaves. What is his full name, Tony? Totino. Mm -hmm. Totino. Tony is he Totino. Italian? No, he's Canadian, but I think he's from an Italian family. But he's, ah, okay, he's a that's the guy from the Loose Moose. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So Tony, I think um, uh, his idea, the, he's, I mean, because he's really, he's really sort of st strong Johnstonian background And so he has that sort of very deeply rooted in Keith's kind of way of thinking, which I feel very connected to because Keith came from theater and not from comedy. So that sort of entrance feels very natural for me. Uh, 
så uh, so Tony on one hand and then Sean Kinley on the other hand. Um, so both of them are loose moosers, um, but I think both of them in their different ways um, uh, changed my path in theater, I think. And and also because these are people that I've been able to, I had the luck to work with over many years. I mean, I've been to good workshops, but I don't think a workshop really changed the way you work. Um, like to go to one workshop is interesting and can be fun, but to really learn something from someone, I think you have to to have a connection over years. That's my, that's at least that, that's like that for me. So both of them sort of, I had the pleasure of working with on several occasions over many years. And I think their imprints are all over. Mm -hmm. Nice. And <clears throat> you already mentioned you studied a lot of different things or you did a lot of different things from uh, theology to um, uh, uh, websites uh, mm -hmm. building. Yeah. Um, uh, do you still have a day job or did you ever have a day job? No, at, I, at some point? yeah, I worked in an ad agency when I was like... 20, 21 or something like that. Until I was 23, I think. Then I stopped. And I haven't had a day job since. Mm -hmm. And uh, what, uh, how did you earn your money uh, ever since? Like, oh, well, um, I think... Uh, well, I think as an actor in different ways. I think my improv side and my acting side sort of goes hand in hand a bit in a way that I... I can both be involved in writing, developing stuff. So I've been doing things for TV, a little bit for some movies, and a little bit for radio uh, as a creator. Uh, and then, but also as an actor in different ways. Jeez, I don't know. It's like 17 years since I was 23, <laughs> and I have I don't really know how I made all my money. But I, I every year it seems to work out pretty good. Uh, it's. Uh, It's, um, uh, you know, like uh, freelance actors would, I guess. I do I do some voice work. I do some commercials, um, blah, blah, blah. So summa summarum, there's enough money to run a small family. Um, and of course, having the theater now for almost five years, there's always uh, money from there. I get paid since I'm the artistic director there. I get some money from that. And then... Um, Uh, there's some projects here and there, and I direct quite a bit, more and more. So, and, and then did you actually ever do some? <clears throat> I don't know what's the uh, English word, like some acting training, and I mean not just lessons, but like a whatever three-year professional education as an actor or something like well, that. Or is it all learning on the job more or less? Uh, no, I I I'm I have a degree as a as a drama pedagogue. Ah. So this is my background. This is so so, um, which means that I have a, a lot of acting training, but I'm not a trained actor, <laughs> if you know what I mean. Yeah. Uh, and, and my background is more broader; it's more towards teaching, but it's also a lot about creating and stuff like that. So it's like a drama education. But uh, so, uh, but after that, I've been lucky to get, and I was lucky to get a lot of work right after school, both very conventional theater work, like scripted conventional theater work. But also different sort of small stuff in TV, and st so I, uh, I think I, uh, I, I still feel like I'm just fooling everyone <laughs> uh, when they hire me as an actor. I honestly, I honestly <laughs> think, uh, think that uh, I, every time I do something in TV or wherever, I. I am as anxious every time I go. I have no idea how to do <laughs> to do this, but I guess that's it's probably like that for everyone. I guess. Uh, um, yeah, you feel like a, the I don't know what is the English word. The German word is uh, Hochstapler. You know, like mm. somebody who pretends to be. Somebody yeah, 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 yeah. It's a good like word. I don't know if it's such a good word in English. I can't. There, there is one in English, but. Oh. Well, there's the word of a being a dilettante, though. No, but I but don't that's mean a dilettante. That. I mean somebody who's like really good in pretending. Yeah, 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 yeah. Something while he's actually not. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's a, it's like the, that's and that's also the business of being an actor. Right? <laughs> so it sort of goes hand in hand, I guess. <laughs> I guess. Yeah. <laughs> 
Um, yeah, so you were already um, talking a bit about uh, that André uh, Théâtre. Yes. Mm. Um, uh, if, if you have to give a very short pitch, then uh, what is that André Théâtre? It's a 165-seat theater in Oslo. The only uh, theater solemnly for improvised work or um, improvised uh, inspired work in some way in uh, the whole of Norway. Uh, it has uh, six to ten shows per week. Uh, and it's run by uh, uh, it's owned by a lot of the performers and it's uh, run by a small administration so there's like a small staff technical and administration like financially and there's an artistic leadership um, so it's like a small regular theater but it's just that most of the work there is improvised and how big is the ensemble? Like, um, not uh, the, with the people doing the administration, but really just the just the young, I think the ensemble, if I'm not wrong now, it's 18. Okay. So it's quite a big ensemble. Um, and in the ensemble, I'd say there's a good, maybe there's a good, uh, maybe there's a handful of people who has one, two, three. I'm just trying to figure out if how many people have a day job. There's one, but most of them was no, almost no one has a decent job there. <laughs> this one is a drama teacher. There's one who's a, a sound designer. So there's people sort of, their work is sort of connected to the, there's a couple of students uh, who are still studying, who's in the ensemble. Um, but yeah, 18. And, and a lot of them are working as uh, actors or are doing theater or comedy work also outside the theater. And uh, you have your fifth anniversary in September 2016, so this year. Correct. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, okay. You guys, you already mentioned it. Um, you, you have an acting background, at least many of you, right? I overheard some conversation you had yesterday with yes. one guy because he was asking exactly the same question. So how much acting background do the people in the ensemble have? Uh, well, there's, there's quite a bit of them who are trained actors who have like, you know, a three-year education I, th I think maybe half of the ensemble or something has that kind of a background. And then there's a lot of people who have, uh, uh, there's a couple who have the like a drama, pedagogue sort of entrance like I do. Uh, and then there's a couple of people who's been autodidact in the way that they learn the craft by doing it. Um, but I don't remember the exact number, but I, I do have a... a a slight feeling that when we've been playing in festivals that this might be this might be if if there's like a style to our work <laughs> if that's possible to say i think maybe that the the acting background or like the connection to uh, scripted work is probably one of the things that defines our work in a way that there are some stage craft involved maybe it's tricky to say when you're inside, but the, from the feedback I get, that's that's usually one of the things that I end up discussing, like you overheard last night, that the idea that uh, it seems like you're actors in a way, and that people sometimes maybe lack that, or they or they miss that when they watch uh, improvised theater. That I, I do, actually, because you, <clears throat> uh, at least for me by now, I've seen so many improv shows that uh, it really makes a difference for me by now to... Um, to see people who have at least a bit of an acting background on stage yes. versus, yeah, not non-actors. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So. I mean, it's obvious also there's there's some really sort of uh, very basic things about using your voice, staging your body, and the idea of text, for instance, that uh, I think if you had the experience of working with really good text, I think you get you get some experience into what kind of text actually works on stage. I mean, if you've done Harold Pinter, you have um, a yeah. Pinter, like Harold Pinter, like a, he's, a, he's like a, a writer in theater. Like a, And if you've done him, then you have had the feeling of standing on the stage and doing some really good text. And then that sort of, I think that transfers somewhere in your brain. And when you don't start to improvise, you know, oh yeah, because there's not just about rambling on like you were walking in the streets. 
word on stage has a certain kind of feeling also. Uh, so knowing how to start a dialogue, how to do the tricks that writers do, I think is is nice for for text on stage. And although uh, <clears throat> I would say, especially in regards to your show from last night, yes, um, that the secret is actually to have these uh, conversations, which are just like small talk on a party, because that's what makes. Um, Many pieces realistic. Also, if you look at I don't know the the old Tarantino movies, it's exactly yeah. the same. They they talk all this bullshit, yeah. and if you manage to do this um, on stage, it's what actually makes it hmm. uh, lively and vivid. And I don't know the the yeah, English yeah, yeah. word now. It's interesting, I mean, but but also I think just if you've if you read good text, uh, it also has some kind of level to it to to be able to look for you know different levels in the text so you for instance think that uh, there's uh, even in a very uh, straightforward as like in a Tarantino like the opening of uh, Reservoir Dogs when they're sitting around talking about tips he said I don't tip what you don't tip so there's there's uh, that that they talk about sort of something that strikes you as nonsense but it's at the same time it's very character defining and it's defining uh, this world in a way so text has all these qualities outside being just the words that you say. So I think a lot of improvisers sometimes tend to forget that when you say something, it has a potential of being a lot of different things. It could be, uh, it could read some kind of symbolism that you could use. You could still talk about it like it was an ordinary thing. I think like last night there was like a thing. Like a metaphor. Or... Yeah, yeah. Like last night we ended up with a woodpecker. Uh, and so we would uh, introduce the idea of a woodpecker just talking about it. And we didn't know it was, had any effect, but to be able to look for that in a text and then go, ah, oh, there was something about that woodpecker. Maybe we could try that again in some dialogue and see what happens if we repeat it and see what does it tell us about the woodpecker. And then suddenly you go, ah, oh, yes, a woodpecker is actually trying to get a hole somewhere to find a place to stay. And so it's so then suddenly you start to, you know, uh, look for stuff inside the text. And I think that it it's easier to do that if you've already had to analyze a really good text and try to perform it on stage. So that kind of experience from scripted work, I think, is transferable. I don't think it's necessary, but it's it's some good qualities in it. It's some interesting qualities in that. I know in a lot of um, uh, in a lot of um, in improv work people are saying be more physical talk less be more physical and they always it's like a mantra that improv should be as physical as possible i'm not sure if that uh, i makes sense i don't think it makes sense but the other (coughs) extreme doesn't make sense either i've seen i've seen groups especially when they perform on very small stages who are just like this typical talking heads, they stand and it's like stand-up comedy. They talk and they do nothing. This no, doesn't right. work. Absolutely. Either. Yeah, yeah. There's ways of doing, you know, bold scene movements where you like... The, this also has to do with training. If you've been directed by a good director, you know that there are ways of moving on stage that has a certain effect. Like crossing someone in the back and talking to them from... Yeah, I saw you doing this yesterday. Yeah. So it wasn't like the... Classical sweep, which you do in front of the no, people, but in right. the in the back. In the back, and so there's this way. Also, during a dialogue, there's ways of placing yourself that makes it interesting and sort of building and gives more opportunity and air to the text. But uh, uh, also the idea of being more physical. And uh, sometimes I have a feeling that that has to do with that. A lot of improvised text is really poor. It's not that it's too much of it. It's just that what you hear is a bit poor. For instance, if you look at the opening of Reservoir Dogs, then in Tarantino, you would never say that, because they talk a lot in that scene. It's like, blah, 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 blah. They hardly move because they sit around the table. So it's not about them being physical. It's just a matter that the text that they say is good, which is trickier when you improvise, of course. But I, I wouldn't say that there is an absolute that physical always is better than verbal. I say if you say something really good uh, and it's emotional and powerful, then that is good as well. How did you guys rehearse this? Because I noticed this already in Gothenburg. Um, how did you re- rehearse these kind of dialogues or this quality of to 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 reach this kind of quality of dialogues? <sighs> well, that's a good question. Um, how did we rehearse that? I think it comes from other work. 
I don't think we rehearsed the idea of text here in that way. But what we did rehearse, what uh, was uh, um, we tr not re yeah we, we were looking for ways of of um, going in and out of scenes where we would do we would cut ourselves a little bit into the dialogue. So we would very rarely, maybe I'd say maybe three or four times yesterday, we would start the scene. We would be hello, welcome, like the beginning of a conversation. We would more often, we more often try to look for places where we go in and say, but that doesn't make sense. Why don't you come with me? Like you start a conversation at that point. Because um, that I think we talked about that a lot and trying to find ways of sort of cutting in to other scenes in that way. Um, but I think the way of working with text, like I think comes from a broader work, idea of work that we do at our theater. Uh, I would say, and I think also just just looking at we, we I mean we looked at so many romantic comedies mm -hmm. <laughs> when we started off. I bet I've seen all of yeah, them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and we, I mean, we did we do the format because we love romantic comedy, and and we think that it's possible with doing the work in this genre that we could say something valuable that we can't say in another show. So it's no idea. I think it's no use just doing. Um, Uh, a genre just for the genre you should do it because it gives you the opportunity to do to say something yeah. and um, before coming to that I have uh, one uh, last question about your role in that Andre Theater mm -hmm. um, because you already mentioned you are or you you have the role of the artistic director correct what does that mean what does that involve what what do you do what are you like? Well, it's uh, Mats, who's always playing in this show, is my associate artistic director. So, uh, I mean, basically, we're two artistic directors. So we work very closely about uh, programming uh, the season, putting up uh, what shows should play, how many shows should they play. We look at the repertoire. How many, how many shows do you personally play in, like per week? or? It, it varies a lot because uh, some seasons I... Tell myself this season I just want to watch a lot of shows, so I'll play less. And then last season I think I had only one show that I played, uh, but then I played like uh, no two shows. So I played probably one one show a week, but then I would watch a couple of shows also. So and then other times I would maybe be in like three or four different shows, and then I play a couple of shows a week. So it varies a bit. But our, I mean, I think the most the finding work that we do is on this, that we this, we look at the, our repertoire and we go, so for next season, what should we take off? What should we not play anymore? And where are there holes? Like, are there areas in improvisation that we feel is lacking in our work? Should we try to find a show that does that? Should we ask someone to develop a show in this kind of thing or in that direction? So we sort of, we we talk about the long term of artistic development in the ensemble uh, and in our program so we don't get stuck, so we don't get shows that are crutches. So if like we had a, a musical that was enormously popular, sold out every weekend, uh, and then uh, we, at the same time, we felt like this is, this is an okay show. It's not, we don't felt it was a really good show. It was like an okay show. And at the same time, we thought we shouldn't let that show go for many more seasons. It was like on for four seasons. And then we thought, even if it, you know, brings home the money, we should take it off. So we make sure that we don't rely on one specific show or stuff like that. So these are the kind of discussions that we have. Um, uh, and also looking at how to recruit uh, more, uh, how to, yeah. How to lay the ground for more um, recruiting and uh, and uh, and how to give the people in the ensemble um, paths that they can follow and inspire them to do new work. Um, we talk a lot about these things because that's that's really tricky. I think I mean as an artistic director, you don't have to be the best improviser. I'm not the best improviser at our theater, but I think you have to hopefully be the one who could uh, have the best eyes to see this uh, what is going on mm. in a way and 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 to be able to 
think a little bit in the future and think, oh, there's it's too much of this now. So many shows have this kind of a feeling. We should have more room for this or that. Uh, yeah, this is what we do. And, and does the role of artistic director also involve um, creating formats, like, for example, the romantic comedy, or is that uh, ensemble work? Well, it, it, th this depends a little bit. I mean, this season, for instance, we needed another show that could uh, rotate the whole ensemble because we felt we missed... Uh, we had too few shows where everyone could meet up and play. Uh, not everyone at the same time, but, you know, a place where all the ensemble members could play. Because shows like this romantic comedy, there's only five people in the ensemble who sort of was part of that development, part of that idea. So then uh, I sat down during the summer and I had a little bit of chat with Mats and a little bit with some other improvisers. And I was saying, I wanted to make, um, I had this idea of a, like a Grace Anatomy, sort of a hospital drama soap thing and so then i made a little format about that and then we put it up in the fall so then i made the format and i directed it several times before some other people directed just to get it on its feet the way i thought it should be but then uh, we also have a system called uh, like a um, crash test dummy, like a test dummy uh, series of shows where people can apply to the artistic leadership to get they get a little budget and they get uh, three nights Uh, to do uh, to explore one idea uh, it could be anything like a show about uh, violence or you know about uh, a show in the darkness or whatever it is and then uh, they will get a little bit of a budget to explore that and um, and uh, if that turns out to be an interesting show that is very often the start of a new show like the romantic comedy came through that We also have a, a, a hip-hop, uh, like a rap show that also came through that. So some shows come through that, like it comes from some specific group of, like a constellation within the ensemble. And I feel that those shows are really valuable to a theater where there's like four or, five, four or five people that goes, we love this. I mean, we're so interesting in this or that. Because that, that show comes on stage with a really big inspiration Uh, and an enthusiasm that I think is rare, really valuable instead of me as an artistic director or Mats as an artistic director going, yes, that's a good idea, but everyone who wants should be able to play in that show. So we don't do that. We just say sometimes some people would want to do a show together and sometimes else this. So there's, there's, there's a variety to what kind of shows. And sometimes we even see some shows and we go, oh, we should do that format. That mm -hmm. looks really nice. We don't do that very often, but sometimes we do that. And then uh, we just ask in the ensemble, who's interested in working with this? And then, you know. Well, makes sense. Another question to, uh, just occurred to me. You don't have to answer it, but uh, I'm just uh, pretty cu uh, curious. When you bought that theater of that uh, father of your friend of yours, um, how, how did you finance it? I mean, did you guys have some savings or did you take credits or how, how did you like? Well, both. Uh, we, we didn't take any credit. We didn't, we didn't take any loans. Um, yeah, loans. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, yeah, yeah. No loans. We, um, we did uh, whatever we had to do. We had, you know, flea markets. So we put up our savings and made a shareholders company. So we said that everyone who wants to chip in, everyone who wants to have a share could uh, buy a share. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of performers who did that. Um, and some of us put in more money than others because <laughs> we had more money, I mean, savings. And, and how did you deal with that? That these people then have like more uh, permissions or rights or whatever? Yeah, I mean, it's just for the General Assembly. It's just, it's a very sort of classical shareholders company. The General Assembly, the more shares you have, Uh, the more votes you have. Okay. But um, the artistic... Do you also have votes and artistic questions? No. Okay. The the No, not at all. And we have a board who's like sort of responsible for the day-to-day, -day, like week-to-week -week sort of follow-up on staff uh, and also artistic work. But no, the artistic uh, decisions, because the General Assembly elects um, and hires the uh, uh, artistic director. Okay. So that's the only person that the General Assembly elects, which I think is important. Because, especially for us, because the General Assembly mainly is performers. A couple of people who have not performed, but most of them are performers or former performers at the theater. 
So, um, uh, and then we just worked really hard. We got ourselves a popcorn machine, <laughs> which is really valuable because it's so good, mommy. Uh, it's good for the smell. It's good for the smell because it feels more like a, you know, like a Tivoli or some kind of amusement park than. A Have theater. you ever been to uh, the um, Unexpected Productions Theater with this gum wall in Seattle? No, no, no. <laughs> Just occurred to me because of the smell. Because um, when you uh, when you're in there in the foyer, you always smell the gum. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, these things are important. I find because it uh, it gives us uh, a certain brand for us at least that we're we're that theater where you can buy popcorn and bring into the theater. Hmm. So you sit with a big bucket of popcorn. It, <laughs> it it's more like a circus, which I which I like because it makes it less pretentious. It makes it. Yeah, I think that's important for us, and it's a good it's good business. Popcorn is really good business. <laughs> good to know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, everyone should have a popcorn machine. It's like I don't know, ninety percent uh, like benefit. Uh, that's what uh, that's ninety percent profit or something. Really? Yes. I mean, and the popcorn itself. I yeah. thought like yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. so it's, it's it's stupidly good business. I mean, if I didn't, if I wasn't an actor, I would be in popcorn business <laughs> okay. for sure. I, see. I would have a big popcorn store. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, okay, Nils, uh, let's um, use the opportunity to talk about And Then They Met. Yeah. You're a romantic comedy format. Um, can you explain in a couple of words how the format works? Yes, it's based on the idea of a romantic comedy um, and therefore also loosely based on the classical dramaturgy of a romantic comedy. Uh, that said, uh, as I mentioned, there's no set beats, dramaturgical beats in it. Um, but we uh, and we try to explore different ways of framing a romantic comedy story. Um, we have an we have a uh, we have an opening to the show. We have a way of sort of uh, starting up with a monologue and uh, a little thing that we call a tornado, where we have a we start off. We're a couple of questions with the audience, and then one of us who feel inspired starts a monologue based on those suggestions or one of the suggestions. And then the other actors will add in characters um, that we use, uh, might use or use uh, in in the story. <coughs> so... so so it's not like that before the show you say, okay, um, this time Christine plays the, the hero or no. Niels or Matt or whoever. None and, of that. It's, and it's, it's also not that you say, because you get a couple of suggestions that you say it's always the dream which has to inspire you to the beginning monologue. No, no, it could be anything. We, we have like, a, there's, there's, a, there's a certain amount of kind of questions that we ask that I guess we walk around on because there's, some ideas that we find very inspiring when we ask them it gets good material, uh, but no, there's no. We don't. Uh, we don't. Uh, we don't talk about that. Uh, we really want it to be uh, based on how we feel and who's inspired to do whatever. And um, you have a couple of uh, suggestions that you get, like, that like you always get, because the two times I've seen the show, you asked uh, both times. I think for a dream, you ask for. A thing which was settled yesterday i cannot remember what it was in gothenburg mm. and you sister was it a sister uh, in gothenburg i think it was six pair of scissors uh, something like that and you asked for a hobby yeah and yesterday you were also asking for kind of in like an event or party which i think you didn't ask for in gothenburg if i remember no correctly. and there's a couple of more sometimes we ask for three sometimes we ask for four and they rotate a lot around some of those questions. We sort of found some questions that we that we think gives us the kind of material that we need, but that still that are questions that are so open that that we don't get repeating material. If you know what I mean. Uh, if you ask people, what's your favorite kind of food? I assume you will get a lot of pizza, for instance. So if you do that show over and over again, where you base on people's favorite food, you'll get a lot of the same kind of food. But we try to find questions where there's a variety of answers. So that's basically what it is. Mm. And are there other like key elements of the format that I don't know you guys have rehearsed? Because you said there are like no beats, no. but I guess there are some kind of key elements. To yeah, the yeah. There's there's something that we try to remember. Like we try to remember that um, 
uh, we want the characters to the 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 protagonist and the love interest. We want them to um, have some kind of different viewpoint on life. So uh, either that or uh, it's different ways of doing it. There, there's like a menu of different things that we. There's like um, it's like a box of tools that we could use. It's more like that than beats. So that idea that either you can have, for instance, like a, a protagonist and antagonist that share a goal. So they want the same thing. Uh, like in... But uh, in a different way. Or... or they fight about the same thing in the workplace. Say, for instance, Anchorman, which is sort of like a romantic comedy in some level. I just try to remember. It, it was with Jim Carrey, right? No, no, no. With the... With the uh... <sighs> Ah, uh, Steve Carell. Yeah, Steve Carell is <clears throat> in it, and and it's 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 uh, the guy who wants to. He works in a new station, and there's like a new lady coming, and she is really good, and he's falling behind. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. they both want to be the anchor woman or man, but so that's one way of doing it. So you could couple them up like that, but you can also have like the occasional meeting. You know, someone meeting in a cafe, and one is really, re like the if the protagonist is really messy. You'd have an antagonist who's like really st like strict and you know everything's in place, and so you need some kind of conflict material in in that. So that's what we're looking for. Mm -hmm. And is it always the opposite, like the um, like the hero, let's say, and the uh, the lover of him or her? Is are they always like opposite characters? No, 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 no. And yesterday they were sort of the same. They had uh, some similar qualities to them. They were but both, I mean, he uh, was he was kind of shy and a bit of, <laughs> you know. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, she was uh, she was not very shy. No, she, she was, was tougher. The, yeah, exactly. Absolutely, but the, I mean, there's there's for uh, there's uh, there's. And, and he was the kind of a dreamer, and she was the re realist, and she was also like, he he was kind of outgoing while she was uh, like you know locking up herself in her flat yes. and stuff like that. So there's there was there was some, but we've had also shows where there's yeah. like enormous difference. Like you would have one. Who loves money, and one who who leaves everything and tries to save people on the street, you know that it's like that's uh, like the classical big sort of difference in in protagonist and antagonist in romantic comedies that they would have this very different background. One really rich guy and a really simple poor country girl meeting up, like. You know that idea, uh, and they both have to change. And in this way, I think uh, I wanted to ask this question later, but it just uh, fits. So they both have to change, and in this kind of uh, way, it's some kind of a hero's journey for both. At least that's how I yes. see it. And it's tricky because uh, it's a re uh, romantic comedy has uh, one flaw that you could easily fall into, and that's you get a split protagonist, so that you get two protagonists. So you you follow both characters in the same way and you get the same kind of empathy for both of them, which is tricky in romantic comedy sometimes. And sometimes you will have a split uh, protagonist. Like in uh, uh, when Harry met Sally. Do you remember that? with um, uh, From the 80s, like a classical good uh, romantic comedy. In that one, there's, uh, there's oh, I'd say there's as good as a split protagonist. They're both protagonists. But they're also both their... Uh, each other's antagonist in a way, so it's it's. Uh, oh, this gets really technical, but uh, it's interesting <laughs> to me. It's interesting to me. Um, uh, either way, I forgot your question. Uh, the question was, um, yeah, basically just that both characters have to develop an order oh, yeah, 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 to, yeah, 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 to reach their their goal, which is like they get Absolutely. together at the end. Yeah, yeah, they have to learn something from each other. Exactly. Um, I mean, so in that way, it's like a hero's journey, but it's not the classical hero's journey dramaturgy in a romantic comedy, or not always, at least. Uh, it's it's a but there is difference. kind of a mentor, at least both. Um, and, and and both pieces I saw there is like a best friend of the protagonist. Yes, best I girlfriend guess. or best boyfriend. <laughs> Although yesterday he was all, he, they had a bit of a funny relationship because he was always shagging the girls that the other guy. Yeah, <laughs> he was not a very nice best friend, but I think in some way I felt like we, we understood why he was like that when he met his parents in towards the end, which was an interesting thing. But yeah, I think the, there's um, there's uh, some kind of characters, reoccurring characters. It's the it's the best friends 
uh, or the good friend. There's also the, which we didn't have so much last night, which is like the occasional mentor, the character that would teach the protagonist something almost by accident. There was, we were about to have it when I played the drunk guy in the waiting room. I, and the niece, maybe. And the niece was the occasional mentor. Yeah, that's true. The niece would turn out to be the occasional mentor. And, and the drunk guy could be it. I was, when I was there, sort of half asleep, half drunk by his side, I was actually going through my mind. Oh, I could now sort of ramble a little bit and then suddenly say something that points directly to his heart, in a way. So I let it go because I felt there was another scene going on that I shouldn't be screwing with. But uh, that is a typical question. A typical character, I mean. Um, there's also the uh, um, the uh, like the work, like your the, the boss, which is like a, a ver it's like a uh, it's a version of the best friend in a way. So it's someone who gives but you more troubles, demanding, but right? more demanding in a way. So there's there's this palette of of characters. So we don't we don't say that this and this have to be in there. This has to be like this or. Uh, but there are moments that are like stuff that we enjoy visiting, like the big public announcement, for instance, which is a romantic comedy treat where someone is, you know, doing a, like they have a, um, there's like a big public occasion, someone has released a book or something, and then uh, it's towards the end, and then suddenly the love interest comes and says, stop, stop this. I need to tell you something. And then everyone in the room goes, oh, what's he going to say? And it's like, look, I, I've done this all wrong. I've been looking at it all wrong. I'm really sorry. I love you. Like this kind of public announcement is something also, it's like a little tool in the toolbox again that it's nice to visit because it has a very sort of obvious romantic comedy reference. So there's these scenes, like also like uh, uh, we were almost going to do it last night. I felt we were like sort of touching it, the dinner scene, which is like another idea from romantic comedy where you would have the a combination of people that shouldn't be in the same room but they're there for social reasons so it could be a dinner it could be another like a mingling party or something where four people have to interact within the like in the framework of a really um, strict social situation <laughs> like like a dinner party you can't really just go bananas in there but there's like this it's like a lid on the but situation. In, in both pieces, you had the dinner situation. You had it yesterday uh, with the two girls and uh, Mats. So you were missing in that. And in uh, Gothenburg, I think it was all four of you. So it was... Yeah, then, uh, we, had the, then we had more like the... That's in Gothenburg. Uh, I think we had what I would call a classical dinner scene. Yesterday, that was just like a... For me, it was just like a... It, it didn't feed... It didn't do what those kind of dinner scenes usually okay. do for me. Um, but yeah, it was the same sort of location in the dinner room. But I mean, uh, there's... But it's, yeah, I think yeah, it yeah. was in both, uh, if I had to analyze it, I would say yeah. in both cases it was like the um, protagonist and the, the girl or boy he's um, going to get together with. Yeah. They kind of build their own world in this dinner scene against the others which are sitting yes. there. And for them it's like... Who they have something on their own, which is kind of strange. So yeah, yeah, yeah. It's also these kind of situation makes people sit very tight, which is good, like a dinner party or you know sitting in a car driving to a cabin or all of these situations where people have to sit close. It's good because you can have this occasional. This is another. This is another nice little trick, which is the occasional um, physical touch. So you would have someone, I think they did it in the scene when they were watching the dolphin or something, when they suddenly realized they were holding each other's hand. I think it was a great moment because they realized it at the same moment as the audience did. They were like, the audience was like, <gasps> and they were like, whoa. It was like, oh, I wasn't supposed, I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't mean to. So those kind of moments it's nice to play with also because it's like a typical romantic comedy thing. Where, But it's also a typical thing in life that you would your emotions would go a little bit further than you would do so um no not for me <laughs> <laughs> no neither for me actually so that's why i enjoy doing romantic comedy because i can be whatever i am not in life so that's uh, i'm not a very is your wife going to <laughs> hear this well i think she would uh i think she would uh my boyfriend sign... is by the way I'm yeah 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 <laughs> 
No, no, I mean, I mean, she would sign up that I'm, I'm not a very romantic, uh, I'm not a very romantic guy. But, oh. But uh, that's, that's that's what's fun with theater. You could do, yeah, you, I mean, you can do stuff that uh, you can explore stuff that you don't explore so much in life. That's one of the great things about theater. Yeah, so. absolutely, I fully agree. Um, one one other question bothered me. Yeah. Uh, uh, about the niece. So yeah. the niece was introduced very early, and then I was wondering, did you just? forget about her or was it on purpose that she was reintroduced only so late i think we all thought in the beginning we thought that the niece because she came in the tornado in the opening that we all felt in the beginning that it was mm, it was an interesting relationship but i think most of us thought that this character is not gonna come back it was just part of the opening so yeah because because she came back And then the um, yeah I, I I yeah I don't think we forgot about it but I think we sort of shelved it and thought no I don't think she's gonna come back um, that's hmm. yeah and she brought back the woodpecker which was interesting but that turned out to be a really for me at least I thought it was a very rich. Yeah, it was a good metaphor I for think. something, mm. which is great. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it's kind of a metaphor for development. It's like, especially when he picked into the metal, metal yes, yes, thing, that was like, a great. Okay, you, you have to continue, or he's picking as long as he yeah, can yeah, yeah. get a home, and he's not giving up, even yeah, though yeah, he's yeah, now yeah. out of metal and so on. Yeah, that was a really nice one from Mats that he he defined it so he was hitting metal yeah and um another question i have is about the characters that you play in gothenburg yeah. it was so that um the girl the the protagonist she was only playing that role while um i think Mats at this time was playing a lot of different roles yes you were playing the the antagonist the lover or whatever and some kind of other roles and then uh, there was this other blonde girl who was like playing all the other girls yeah roles. yeah, yeah. is it so because and yesterday I realized so the the most parts of the show Mets was playing just the protagonist. the protagonist yes but then only at the very end he he slipped into this servant role do yeah. you have like a rule where you say the protagonist is usually not to play any other characters besides the protagonist or does it just happen uh, I th no there's no rule. Uh, there's no rule, but I think it happens by itself, sort of. And I think it's a valuable thing. I I don't think the person who plays the protagonist should do a lot of different roles. But I I I I, I can't see it happen either because I think the protagonist is probably in I'd say 90% of the scenes. So there's there's usually no room. I know Mats loves to play these sort of sidekick uh, B-plot comedy characters. So uh, I could see him longing to get in there to do a little bit of uh, funny stuff with the waiter. And he's really good at it. So that's sort of... Uh... But yeah, I, I, don't, I don't mind it when it happens, but I just it, it will re rarely happen because you have to have the protagonist in very often because if you don't, you lose the, you lose the journey for that character. And how do you guys on stage ensure that um, you recognize the characters or let's say that you don't mix up the different characters someone is playing. So I noticed you work with clothes a mm. bit. So you put the jackets on, you put the jackets off, you put the color up or down or something yes. like that. Is that the only way how you ensure that you um, don't mix up the characters or how, how do you go about this? Uh, yes, I think that's the only, that's the most, effective way at least uh, for the audience to see the difference I think that's why we use the clothes actually it's because it helps the audience a lot to see the difference between the characters but in Norwegian when we do it in Norwegian we also do more accents to help out because it's enriching a character if it comes from a certain part of the country or you know stuff like that so we use that wording but we also use like way of talking so there's a different i mean they're all the different character traits we would use uh i for instance had i mean i did a couple of characters last night i think where i didn't change clothes but there was other traits that i gave it that mm. would um, that would change it like yeah, the guy and, the guy and that yeah. is the thing because for me 
um, from an audience point of view, it was not always clear in the, let's say, first 20 seconds, who is he now? Is yeah. he now the rich guy who's going to buy the dolphin? Yes. Or is he uh, like uh, the, the, what was his name, Sack, the, yeah, like yeah. the best friend guy? Absolutely. There was a couple of moments where I think we were all a bit... Uh, confused uh, and uh, I guess that happens uh, we don't I think we note it we usually give a note about it that it was a bit tricky to know the difference between that and that character and then we try to remember that for the next time but it's not one of those notes that we take that we I mean that doesn't bring us down because we know it's sort of part of it that sometimes that will happen because this show is even though it's kind of laid back Mentally, it's kind of high paced. There's, there's not much of you know. Oh, well, I would say it's even high paced on stage. Yeah, good. I mean, at least for we wanted to be it's one of the like faster shows where a lot of cool. stuff is happening. I, yeah. Well, we, I, I, I always imagine it. I like it when it's like uh, jumping down, um, you know, a little stream like uh, where there's stones in it. So you have to go hop, 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 hop through the water. Like uh, jump from stone to stone to stone. When the show works really well, it feels like that. If it's like, hoi, ho, hoi, and it feels very um, effortless, uh, but still quick. So it's not like we're pushing it because we don't try to be quick, but we like to have. It also has to do with the way we start scenes, I think. That's what some of the things that makes it feel like a little bit of an upbeat tempo to it, because we usually go straight into scenes and go. Like I, yeah, I would say, no, 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 no. I didn't mean that she was, you know, stupid. I'm just saying she wasn't smart. <laughs> you know, I would start off a scene like that, which makes it feel like we're going gong straight into something. Mm. But we try to find, I mean, usually also we try to find some scenes that linger some more, that has some kind of other stage. But I think we had the, the scene yesterday where I was continuing my dialogue. I was continuing, I had, I know my dialogue, my monologue, I mean, uh, out after, um, what was his name last night? Frank had left. And I was saying, I was explaining why I slept with his girlfriend. And then yeah, yeah, yeah. the girlfriend came on and she was sort of painting a little bit. And then he came on and he was like, I, I couldn't really see what he was doing. But there was like this more like a tableau, which, would, which we kept on going for quite a while. So we always try to look for these kind of staging moments, like scenes that would blend on top of each other, where there's more like a a rhythm kind of um, image mm -hmm. based scene also, okay. which, which I think sort of sometimes could be helpful just to, for the audience to just go, okay, so no, it's not that much information going on. It's just, we staying with that emotion for a while, a little bit like this, blah, 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 blah. I don't know. Mm. Is there a minimum set of, characters that the romantic comedy form needs like i mean of course it's the protagonist and the loved one then the best friend probably of the protagonist mm, 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 and mm, mm. are there any other like um, um not not optional but uh what is the opposite of optional i don't know but like characters that are definitely required has to be in it yes exactly uh are there no I don't think there are. I think uh, we did a show just uh, before Christmas where we had, uh, I think, only one character each. I was the brother of the protagonist. She was... Uh, the the girl was the protagonist and then Mots was the love interest and the other one was a friend of the protagonist. And then we had maybe the father coming in very towards the end. But apart from that, almost no other characters. So I think you can get away with a lot. It does demand much better text, though, because you really have to get some dialogues that that develops the characters enough so you sort of still keep your interest in them. These are the things that are hard when you improvise, of course, because it's not tricky to be funny and make good dialogue, but it's to enter, to, to get dialogue so that the character is actually slowly changing during the course of actions. That's, it's just because, mm -hmm. I mean, improv is a, is a great tool, but it's not very precise. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, so the fewer characters you have, the more you have to lean towards to have the characters do this sort of very organically changing through every dialogue is changing a little bit more, gives you another trait, blah, blah, blah. Um, but when you have more characters, you can play more around with it and the change could be smaller, but 
we can jump in time and do all of this jump from location to location where people doesn't have to be included. So what, because I was just thinking of the hero's journey again, what is the biggest difference then to a traditional hero's journey? I mean, except for the fact that it's about love and that it's about two people and not one person. But apart from that, I think it resembles it. Absolutely. Very much. Yeah, yeah. And I think a lot of the dramaturgical forms sort of lean towards the hero's journey just because we like to see a character change, who change. And develop. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So it's, yeah, it's well, not uh, only the change. It's For me, it's most of the time he, he grows up a bit. And especially in romantic comedy, you see that a lot. Yeah. But somebody, he's maybe in his mid or her mid 30s, Uh, but he might not be grown up or not grown up enough. And then this That's true. love things change, changes him or her to become a bit more grown up. There's there's something in the hero's journey where very often I find that the hero has to struggle towards a world that doesn't let him be who he is. Say, for instance, um, what's that? Uh, Billy Elliot, the movie, Billy Elliot, about the kid, who, the wants kid dance, who wants to dance. dance. The gay so it's like a very sort of perfect dramatic in it so you, we can see a boy who lives in a world where he is not allowed to dance even that is his biggest dream so he goes on this journey where he explores his dream about dancing and he takes some risks and he learns a lot of stuff during the course of his actions and he ends up in a world where he can now dance so the world the sort of the context of his life has changed and he has learned to trust himself in a way Mm. We could say so, but in a romantic comedy, the 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 world around maybe is not your biggest enemy. The it's 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 your own. Um, it's, yeah, it's more. It's more the. Uh, I'm not getting together with this person because he or she has exactly yeah it's incorporating it's little, what I hate. Yeah, it's a little bit more internal, sort of. It has to. Yeah, it's a little bit more. Um, But again, you'd have a hero's journey that could do that perfectly well. I don't know. Maybe it's not so different. I, I don't know. Mm. Now suddenly I don't know anything anymore. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> uh, maybe it's not. It's just uh, uh, when you tend to think about too much about, about hero's journey, you, 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 it tends, shows that I've been doing that sort of leans very much towards that kind of dramaturgy. You you have to have the sort of false victory. There's there's so many beats there to, to build the idea of the hero's journey that... It sometimes gets a very heady, gets mm. you very heady. I don't. I always think that dramaturgy is interesting to learn because it could help you solve a problem uh, later when you look back at it. But to build something solemnly, to write something out of dramaturgy, I don't think it's a good. Uh, I don't think it's a very effective way for me to work. Mm. I get very heady with that. Yeah. I know some people doesn't, but I I I like to think that I've learned this. So somewhere in my mind, dramaturgy is just rambling about on its own I'll start playing and hopefully all of this knowledge will come out while I do it but it's not like I'm trying to do what's in here mm. I'm not yeah that's uh, why it's um, even more surprising for me that you have said that there are not like typical beats in the format so this really surprised me because I would have thought or expected that you have like this typical beats and when yeah, yeah. you say you have none um, I'm even more impressed that you manage to to close the loop at the end. Yeah. Well. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Well, thank I you. Mean, <laughs> um, I have nothing. No comments on that. <laughs> uh, I, I think uh, I'm just thinking about to what degree. There's a lot of. I think there's there's a lot of trust in this constellation of people that do this one I think we've we really really trust that everyone on stage can solve whatever crap that <laughs> I'm putting on there <laughs> if I'm not seeing it clearly what's going on someone else will and so there's that's I think that's why it's no need for those kind of beats because somewhere else in that sort of group mind on stage someone will know what to do about it and even if they don't know even if we do like 15 minutes that is crap i mean most of us have been doing this for so many years that we always find a way of you know fixing it even if we don't like it there's ways of fixing it in the end if we have to fix it but uh but the trick is to not 
come to that point where you have to fix it. And dramaturgy sometimes for me makes people look like they're fixing it too much on stage. It's like they're they're doing a they're like technically working on stage. I can see I can see yeah, I know what, what they mean. learned. It's then about yeah, yeah, it's then about mechanics and techniques and whatever yeah. kind of things. So. And that's on really low level. I mean, even in shorter scenes, like in short form, I can see it as well. You can go, yeah, this is uh, I know it's perfectly shaped that scene but I, I can tell what you're doing it's like you're not you're just doing whatever you're a scheme t- yeah yeah and I and I, yeah yeah like yeah. Mm. yeah so yeah um, do you actually have a favorite or a couple of favorite romantic comedy movies and which ones Ooh. well there's um There's uh, oh, there's several because of different reasons. That's the problem. <laughs> But of course, when Harry met Sally is a really good one. It's a good one because it does a couple of really typically romantic comedy st- things. But also cool because it does a couple of things where you go, oh, how are they going to do this? Like the protagonist and the antagonist meets up in the very beginning. It's like the first scene when they go into the car and going to drive to New York together. This is like the first thing. It's like they go straight into it. They say no introduction, which I thought, oh, how they're gonna how they're gonna explore that relationship for so long? And they hate each other. They don't even go through that phase that a lot of romantic comedies do, where they have like all these good times when they're in love, and then something goes bad. They don't really fall in love until the very end of the movie. <laughs> And it's so that's a really great one, and two wonderful actors, so many smart and nice dialogues. It's just, it's it's one of my favorites. Um, there's so many Woody Allen romantic comedies from Woody Allen that I love. I because I love all of Woody Allen's movies. I guess um, there's um, uh, I don't know, you know, Manhattan. All of these ones are so brilliantly done as romantic comedy. I mean, it's basically sort of reinvented the whole idea of romantic comedy. That romantic comedy could be something more than just lightweight, sort of fun and you know, charming characters just like bouncing on and off each other. He sort of put that sort of weight of uh, the existentialistic sort of side of love and relationship into it. Uh, so uh, I guess uh, all of these early ones, but also some of his later ones like Midnight in Paris, and there's there's some really interesting ways of looking at relationship and love through romantic comedy. Um, because it it's just I want to look at it longer when I can laugh, even if it's sad. So uh, are there any newer ones that? Um Oh, there's one that a lot of people doesn't like very much that I actually think is pretty good, which is uh, music and lyrics. I think I've seen that one, but I can't remember right uh, now. Um, uh, it's um, uh, with the, oh, the king of romantic comedy, modern, oh, what's his name? Um, Hugh Grant. Hugh Grant in it. Uh, yeah, he's, he's I've the, seen it. Blonde, uh, yeah, yeah. He's the uh, 80s sort of uh, uh, yeah guy <laughs> who, who's been, he's a has been star. And now it's like a songwriter, and that yeah, it's uh, this yeah, one is yeah, this one people tend to not <laughs> like. That's my experience, but I really thought it was smart because of the context. I thought it was such an interesting sort of framework to a romantic comedy because he he ha- it's like he starts on a point where he knows that he had a perfect life, and it's gone years ago. I don't know. It's something. It's and something. It's the best. I think he's. It's one of his best roles, actually. Hugh mm-hmm. Grant, because he's not such a good actor, I find. But in this one, he's also there's less makeup on him, so he seems more sort of. I don't know. I liked. <laughs> I really like that movie. Oh, I have to watch it again. I guess now. Yeah. <laughs> I and and there's some of the interesting parallels. There's some very nice parallels about creating music, and lyrics. That what's his name of the movie? But the idea of the. That that idea of how music, for me coming from a musical background, because I used to be, a, you know, I used to work with music as well, and that idea of how a melody and text meet each other, like on a very technical musical level, is also a very interesting, nice sort of uh, reflection of what is going on in that movie. So it's, there's some really smart, uh, nice stuff. I like. <laughs> it. 
Okay. Yeah, cool. Um, Niels, you already mentioned you will be here in Berlin for the weekend, right? Yes. Yes. Uh, are you going to watch any improv or will you do just sightseeing here? Well, I was trying to, I have some friends who is going to give me some suggestions about okay. stuff maybe to see tomorrow that. Um, so we'll see. Maybe I'll be roaming the streets watching some improv. Okay, nice. And um, where can people see you perform the next time in and outside of Germany? We will be playing at the festival in March in Berlin. Uh, we will be playing uh, an improvised Ibsen, which is uh, it's more like well, it's kind of like a it's a tragedy, so it's very classical Ibsenish, very talky and and like really old beautiful costumes that we have made. And so there's two other actors. Uh, then it's none of those others, but me, uh, but the two others from the ensemble doing that. That is the 19th of March, I think. It's a Saturday. I don't really know the venue at this moment. Um, it's probably also Ratibor, I guess. Maybe, but they have also a couple of other venues. Yeah, the, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, I don't know. And then we're playing in, as I said, we're playing in Amsterdam, which is not that far away. Mm -hmm. so And when is that? It's um, the last weekend of January. Okay. And we're playing this show uh, on Saturday. Is it the 28th, I think, or something? No, the Friday, sorry. Friday, 28th, 27th or 28th. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, is there anything else you would like to say? Any final words or advice or um, oh. I don't know. Well, uh, I don't know about advice because uh, <laughs> they'll depend on who hears it. There's a great quote somewhere that uh, this was a good book. It does what all good books does. The Dumb people who read it got dumber, the smart one got smarter, and everyone else was completely unchanged. Uh, which I guess it is with everything, <laughs> in a way. Uh, no, I mean, what I would like to see more is uh, if if I could have like a wish for the improv community. I would, I I really wish that I could see people um, doing stuff that inspires them. So they're not caught up in some kind of tradition or school or format that they think is the best or they heard is the most advanced or blah, blah, blah. But that they really find ways of improvising that they find inspiring and not right or wrong in any way. Um, Do I'm, what your heart tells Absolutely. You. I mean, there's no other way of doing good work if you're not inspired, if you're just thinking that you're doing the way Del Close would have liked it or the way Keith Johnston would have liked it. It doesn't matter. You have to be, you have to be heartfelt. It has to be, uh, yeah. It has to be pleasurable. You have to do it out of a wish of having a good time. And there's, I think there's, there's still so many years after all of these schools were sort of made and the tradition came along. There's still uh, so many people who like think that one way of thinking about this is better than another. Mm, dogmatic. Like Very, dogmatic. I've seen crappy improvisers doing theater sports, Harold, any long form, any short form, and I've seen brilliant performers doing all of these shows, and they've been fantastic. So there's, it's like, you have to, as long as you enjoy what you're doing, uh, do it. And if you want to have uh, an audience, You should do that. You should really make the audience see. And if you don't get an audience, then you should stop doing what you're doing. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, Niels, do you have an own website? Well, there's uh, deandretheatret.no mm -hmm. mm -hmm. okay. where people can uh, follow us. And also when, uh, if you go to Instagram, you could see what's going on at the theater. Okay. Um, And you have an entry at the IMDb, haven't you? Me? Yeah, I think so. Oh, maybe I do. I'm not sure. Maybe I mix maybe, it up. No, no, no. Maybe I do. I think because I've been in some movies. Uh, oh, movies Lord. that one outside of Norway could know? Oh, I, I, no, I don't think so. Okay. No, I, I hope not. Okay. Maybe some of my old porn movies, but that's... Ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I have a lot to watch this evening. <laughs> so first Harry and Sally, then Yeah, the yeah, 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 yeah. Music, music and lyrics. lyrics. Yeah. I know. It's perfect. <laughs> I think it's a good order, you know. Like. Why don't people do improvised porn? I want to say yeah, that. Yeah, we were asking ourselves if we should do a Russ Meyer. 
improvised Perfect. Russ Meyer. But then again, maybe all sex is improvised. Maybe it's tricky to imagine that you would have sex and go, so what do you want to do today? Let's make a list uh, of the different positions that we're going to have during sex. <laughs> I don't, that would be weird. Maybe it's better to try to do really planned sex and see how that feels. <laughs> tricky to not improvise sex. Just, yeah. I don't know. Okay, good. Um, yeah, thank you for being here, Niels. Thank you um, for having me. It was great. And, thank uh, you. Yeah, I, I wish you a good time in uh, Berlin the next two days. Yes. Or the two and a half days. And um, I'm going to switch back to German now. Um, oh, I just want to say that if yes. anyone wants to come to Nora and visit our theater, drop us an email and say you're coming and we'll take good care of you. Uh -huh. Thank you. Cool. Yeah, let's see. Maybe I go to Norway then. Oh, I do. <laughs> Ja, ähm, das war Folge 33 meines Impro-Podcasts und die erste Folge im Jahr 2016. Mein Name ist Claudia Hoppe und ich sage Tschüss. <lacht>